Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 107 of Dean Discussions, the podcast for players and DMs alike, where we cover a wide variety of topics to help you with your games. I'm your host, Ryan Reeder, and with me, as always, is my good buddy, Ben Bumhoffer. How are you doing tonight, Ben? I am doing pretty good, Ryan. I am uh, excited to be here. I'm ready to just kind of jump in, dig in, and just have a good old-fashioned chat about. About stuff. Exactly. I just y- you leave it open ended. It's like you know a walkabout in Australia, but this is a chat about. It just you know yeah. w- w- it's whichever way it goes and flows. That's how we're going to yeah, be yeah. doing this. Isn't that how we always do things? Pretty much. I mean, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, we we do have like the the faintest of outlines that we follow and try to you know fill in the blanks in, but uh, this time not as much. Yeah, if our outlines were skeletons, they certainly wouldn't hold up. No. <laughs> But uh, we do have a few really cool things we are going to talk about this evening. We've got a little mailbag segment as we have had several questions come in uh, over the last few weeks uh, that we wanted to get addressed. And also, uh, as well, we had the launch of the Dagger Heart beta uh, just a few days ago at this point. So we're just going to talk about that a little bit um, because... New tabletop RPGs are fun because even if not all tabletop RPGs are for everyone, it's good to have more variety, period. So uh, really cool that we'll have uh, another entry coming in there. But first, let's uh, let's reach into the old mailbag and see what we've got. So uh, our first question comes in from our email. And it says, I love D&D, and I'm going to be playing with two groups. I'm going to DM in those groups because they are all new players, and I have a bit of experience. One of my players walked up to me and said, I have an idea for my backstory. I lost my memory. I don't know anything. Make a backstory for me, and I can't know the backstory even out of character. Those players are so amazing. I think we've talked about this a little bit before oh, the whole I've got uh, the amnesia to bring up yeah, the amnesia this. trope. Um <laughs> I also have a question. Do you have any tips for a new DM with new players? I'm making a homebrew campaign and I don't have a lot of D&D experience. I would love to hear from you. So, Ben, I I know you have lots of thoughts uh, because you had a similar situation to this. So I'll I'll let you kick it off. Yeah, well, first off, um, it it was absolutely great because uh, we started as a one shot. So, you know, um, backstories weren't the biggest important thing at all. So, you know, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, and then when we grew into a campaign, that's when, hey, I want to not know anything about my backstory. Uh, this is just the little bits that I know. Fill in the blanks. Don't tell me about it. And it it was because my player was lazy and didn't want to do his backstory. That is the entire reason why, which was a little annoying. But at the same time, I had a lot of fun with it personally because I was able to kind of go in and based on what I knew of the character. I created a whole family, created a tragedy that happened in the past, created why, you know, he was in a warlock pact without knowing what was going on and all this stuff. And I had this really awesome, great backstory that, um, you know, I would hint at as we kind of played through the game and, you know, little things would pop up like randomly. He was, uh, you know, in this home with a a bunch of other halflings and there's a, um, a little girl who, you know, like started, you know, playing with them and stuff. And, you know, he was just, you know, kind of acting family man, even though he was like really aloof and, you know, didn't really have connections with a lot of people. And as he was doing that, like he started like tearing up without knowing why, you know, just kind of, Oh, there's something that he's repressed or something that he's forgotten or something that's like, you know, the emotions are there, but he doesn't have the knowledge of it. And so I got to foreshadow a whole bunch and, you know, kind of play through it and everything. And the downside is, is that he started not liking the character because of just how much of a backstory he didn't have to go off of. And he was just, you know, kind of playing it straight with, well, I'm just going to kind of do this now. And my patron is the only thing that tells me what to do. But as his patron, I didn't want to be all like, okay, well, now you need to go do this, you know, even in a fun DM kind of way it gets a little old of being like, okay, choose this, choose this. It's like, I was kind of just directing him as opposed to him making his own choices. So you kind of have to be careful with how you're doing with or how you're going about different things with that. Um, However, if 
they are able to have a character who's interested in their backstory, which this character wasn't because he was just there for his patron. I think that you'll have actually a lot more fun with it because those little bits and stuff that kind of like come up as hints here and there will help lead them down their own story as opposed to just, you know, again, the character was designed not to really care about their backstory, which I think that was the, the, the problem that we had going into it. But overall, I mean, it was fun until he chose not to play that character anymore and then switched to a different one who he could definitely get behind and knew exactly what was going on. So. And I think, too, if you have a person who comes to you with that sort of thing, uh, you need to build in reevaluate points every once Mm -hmm. in a while because you're essentially creating all the background for someone else's character, which again, some people are, are totally cool with, or some people might think they're cool with it until you get into it a little bit. And then they just start wanting more ownership, I guess of, of that character. So make sure if you have somebody who comes to you with that sort of thing to build in those, those, you know, recheck points, essentially, where then you talk to that player offline and go, hey, how's it going? Are you enjoying what is playing? What is coming up? Are you enjoying finding out these things? Or are you getting frustrated because of lack of agency or frustrated because this is going in a direction you don't like? Mm-hmm. Uh, so make sure make sure you do that um, so that you can kind of stay in sync with the player. And then if you need to make adjustments. Yeah. If I were doing that all over again, um, I would have actually insisted that they're, they give me more of a framework to begin with. And as long as you have, you know, like the, the skeleton of the house and you know that they're okay with you building the rest of the home, I think that that would work in a much better way than just getting absolutely nothing from it. But again, that, that was how it worked in that situation your situation might be something entirely different and it it all depends on the player really. Yeah, it it really does. And that's why, again, it's, it's good to have those check-in points to make sure that you're both still on the same page and that you're both still having fun because at the end of the day, we want to make sure everyone's having fun. That's, that's really what matters. Exactly. Yeah. Um, And as far as tips for new DMS with new players, uh, you, you chose hard mode going a homebrew campaign. Uh, not that it's a bad thing. I did the same thing. Me too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I can totally, totally understand the allure of that. Just know there's going to be a lot more work involved, building things, fleshing things out. Uh, what I would recommend in that sort of scenario, especially with homebrew is start small, Mm -hmm. start building out wherever the players are going to be and just the area around that, and then start expanding out beyond that. Like you can have a, a grander, uh, world or cosmological or whatever idea just don't get bogged unless you really, really want to, or you, unless you have a ton of time on your hands, don't get bogged down in the minutia of creating all the things before you play. Mm-hmm. Just make sure that you have a solid foundation of where your characters are and the surrounding area, because unless you provide the players with a way to do it, or you're starting the players at super high level, which I would not recommend Uh, If you're just creating a homebrew world, uh, they're not going to be able to get anywhere fast. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to get anywhere that you don't necessarily want them to or get anywhere in any sort of a, uh, a manner of time where you won't have some of that flexibility to prepare for it. Um, So that's, I, I would say start with that. Uh, Also make sure Give yourselves lots of flexibility. Give yourself lots of grace because you're all going to mess up. You're going to have to look rules up. You may have to rule things on the fly. 
and they might be wrong and that's okay. Just say so. And then we'll, and then just move on. Right. Mm-hmm. With whatever the, the right thing is the next time it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, because if everybody's new, there's, there's going to be a lot of that type of stuff. So don't be afraid, especially if you get to a point where people are having to look up stuff all the time, or it's slowing the game down or snow, slowing your narrative down. Don't be afraid to make a ruling at the time and then go back, make a note, go back and check it out later for, so you can do it the correct way in the future. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'll definitely uh, piggyback off of your start small. I mean, when I did my homebrew campaign, I basically started with a town. And then as they were starting to get to the point where it's like, OK, well, we're going to go somewhere else. Then I kind of made like a, a small little region and we did a lot of questing in that region. And then uh, when we were kind of getting near to the end of that, where I knew that they're going to be out and explore more, I created a continent. Uh and in that continent, I had a whole bunch of other regions set up. You know, I had capitals for their those areas, um, city names, you know, in different like types of environments and everything. And to this day, maybe, I don't know, a quarter to a sixth of those are actually like places that I have an idea about of actually what's there, what's going on. Um, there's plenty of little cities and stuff that are, that are in there that... I haven't thought of at all other than, Hey, here's this name of this place. And it's a place where, Hey, if I ever need them to go somewhere to look for something specific or something, I could say, let's just send them there because it has this sort of environment. And I think it'd be fun for us to play in that for a while. And then at that point, that's when I just had go with, okay, well it's in this sort of environment. Let's figure out the people, the townsfolk, you know, like what kind of, of, uh, place would it be and stuff. So <laughs> that way you, you have like, you know, your seeds planted all over the place and you only need them to grow when the time comes to it, which I highly recommend. It's, it's made my life a lot easier. Um, especially, uh, way back during the whole, like when they're, you know, they found out that there were vampires in the town when they sent off all their goods to, you know, a different town. I'm like, well, let's see where the road goes. Oh, they went to this one now instantly because of that, I was able to, to come up with a, oh, well, this is exactly what this town is and what's going on there. And so far they haven't gone there, but you know, if they ever decide to, I have a good kernel based off of something that happened in the game, just from one little tiny thing that, uh, you know, made it grow. Um, and then secondly, just for any new players and stuff, um, as Ryan said, be forgiving, but definitely be forgiving when it comes to combat. That is, you know, one thing that is very different than, okay, I need an athletics check. Just roll your D20. This involves aiming, doing dice damage, figuring out like what actually is an attack roll versus what, you know, the, the DM actually has to roll for like a saving throw versus an attack or a spell or something along those lines. So that's kind of where a lot of the big pieces really start coming into play and like, you know, working together. So having, (coughs) excuse me, um, having one session specifically set up for like the first fight might be a good idea, knowing that it might go long because everybody's trying to get the concept of it and everything. Um, or, you know, if you have a, a session zero, uh, you know, especially with like individuals, maybe kind of uh, give them like their own little tiny bit of combat so they can get an idea of what's going on with their abilities in a small version so that they're not waiting their turn for, you know, the next round of combat to go through or something. Um but yeah, aside from that, just, you know, make sure, uh, you, you know, talk to everybody, make sure everybody's, you know, kind of ready to go and play and, uh, is excited, you know, kind of hype that up a little bit. And then, uh, honestly, the last thing, and we're not sponsored by them. We get no money from them, whatever, but I recommend have your players create their character sheets through D and D beyond that way when they do get like weapons or spells or something along those lines, all the math, everything is there for them right there. It, it adds up, does it all for them. Um, and then when they level up any sort of level up that happens, like if their initiative gets, uh, uh goes higher, um, if they get more health, you know, things like that, again, that also happens automatically as well so that they're able to just kind of, you know, maybe notice the changes, but they're not going to miss something. Cause when I've played before, before D and D beyond was a thing, 
Um, I leveled up like two or three times without knowing that I got more spells or more spell slots based off of like my, um, uh, like my wisdom modifier as a cleric and different things like that. So it turned into <laughs> something that was actually really kind of hard on me until I realized, oh, I'm missing this. I'm missing this. I haven't done this when I've leveled up. And D&D Beyond has been something that's helped a lot with things like that. Yeah, I agree. Having having a way uh, to track things is really nice. Also, new DM, new players um, start st- Starting at lower levels is very, very good. Starting at level one, uh, obviously, is a good thing just to make sure that you can um, really grow into the characters and not overwhelm people too much. Uh, And as a DM, not be overwhelmed too much, especially, like Ben said, by the combat aspect. But just be very careful because level one is the most dangerous level in D and D for combat um, yes, one and mortality of the characters. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh that is something to also be cognizant about uh, and to be very careful of. Yeah. I think we kind of covered some, some good tips there uh, just, just to begin with. And um, I know that this question was brought up on our discord as well. So definitely take, take a look there, you know, see some of the responses. I, I actually know who wrote the, the question and we've already had some of this discussion and stuff there, but it's uh, our discord is a very good place to just kind of jump in and see what people are talking about. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been great. And speaking of that, uh, our next question comes from the discord. Oh. Uh, the, it, it was uh, written in, how do you deal with players? who just have consistently good ideas and bad dice rolls to execute those ideas. I realize bad rolls lead to interesting plot development if handled correctly, but can be extremely frustrating for the player. Do you have any sort of bad luck protection in your games? Uh, I don't. Not, not, not really. Um, But at the same time, as a DM, you kind of have to look at the overall, you know, overall session, overall story, everything that's kind of going on. And especially if you do notice that someone is just whiffing and whiffing over and over again, um, maybe a good suggestion doesn't require a dice roll. If it's something that works, because uh, we've talked on the show many times about how, you know, if there's something that you want to happen, uh, or that you want to have happen, don't ever put a dice roll behind it because there's always a chance that it'll fail. But if you are, you know, looking at someone who's just, you know, kind of down and out and they're, you know, really trying to work on something, don't make them roll. Just give them a couple wins in there because by the end of the day, what's the difference in your game? You know, you're not talking about, oh, well, if I fail this dice roll, the BBEG wins the entire thing. That's something different. That's like end of the game, you know, end end of a campaign sort of thing. Whereas, okay, you know, I think it'd be really cool if I were to um, take this rope, swing across the gap, do a somersault and land. I want to do that. I think it'd be cool. It's the one thing that, you know, I want to get right in this one session. It's like, man, sure, why not? Swing on a rope, that's not too hard. Um, doing a flip, maybe a little hard, but based on the character, they're pretty dexterous, whatever. They're cool. They can make it. Just give it to them. Let them have some fun because there's nothing worse. And I've, I've been a player who has been in situations where it's like, no matter what I roll, I'm not going to get this. This isn't going to work. I'm rolling just so slow. And it, 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 it really does drain on you. It taxes on you a lot. Uh, in fact, I've been in situations where, you know, you come across like, say you're fighting mind flares or something and you need to break their stun. But the only way that this character, how they are built with their stats is going to break it is if you roll a natural 20. That's no fun for anyone because all you have to do is sit there. You have a one in 20 chance of actually getting to do something in combat. So you make the stun break early for whatever reason, whether it's, uh, you know, their chosen God has blessed them and, you know, kind of gives them a kick in the butt so that they're not stunned anymore. Or you're just so mad that you're able to just kind of break it through sheer force of will, or, you know, something along those lines, just keeping everybody involved as best as you can while still, you know, leaning towards the rules is kind of the way to go. At least that's my feeling on that. Ryan, I know that you've DM'd quite a bit in a couple different campaigns now. 
like, do you have any sort of automatic uh, bad luck protection or do you kind of like fudge around with things? That's that's a really good question. So I like the. You brought up a really good example, the specific turn ending status effects. I do have built in protection for those Mm -hmm. because I, as a player, do not like them. Uh, I, as a DM, do not like them for players. It's just the way, at least for this specific system, the system of D&D, the way combat is built. And like you said, there are certain characters that just cannot do certain things Mm -hmm. without an incredibly high role. Um, So I have built in protections that I've talked to my players about in session zero. There's certain things like for stun effects or charm effects or things like that, that they can do something to get out of it early, like uh, take extra damage or, you know, uh, you could potentially just be like, you have to expend some sort of resource. Then explain to me how that resource expending frees you up, right? Stuff like that, because I want there to be a cost to it because it's still an effect that I want to use. But a lot of times when I'm putting it on monsters or things like that, especially when I did not have these protections, I would change those things to be like, this is this just lasts a single turn. Yeah. And then it's gone. It's still taking them out for an entire turn, which is a big deal, but it doesn't take them out the entire combat. Exactly. Which is also a big deal. Um, so things, things like that, I, I, and that, that also allows people to be creative, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, so you failed the save once or twice in a row. You don't have a, a really good chance of getting out of it. Is there a resource you can expend where you can creatively tell me how you could break out of this thing? And a lot of times that gets your players creative wheels turning and they come up with some really cool stuff. So that's, so that's one thing, right? Um, the good ideas and bad dice rolls. Uh, I think you, you basically nailed it on, on what kind of what I would have said, because if you don't want someone to be able to fail, don't tell them to roll for something. So especially if I had a player who was failing a lot one night, Right. And they wanted to came up with something really interesting or wanted to do something. A bad luck protection or a way to deal with that. Just don't ask them to roll Mm -hmm. for what they're doing. Like I do that every once in a while, especially like if Ben says uh, we're talking about a character. This is the type of thing this character is built for. These are the stats type of stats. This character has. It is plausible for this character just to do this. And especially if that player has been having a bad night or the idea they came up with is super cool. I might just let them do it. Yeah. Without a role. That's, that's the absolute best way for guaranteeing that someone can get something done because if there's a dice involved, there's always a chance of failure. Yeah. If you need to have some sort of role involved, don't make a failure an absolute failure at that point. If you're really trying to give them some sort of protection, say they're trying to, uh, I don't know, break into uh, a, a, a room or whatever. And their, their lock picks just are not working or something. They could, you know, say, Oh, your lock picks break in the door, but it also breaks the knob so that you can just push it open or something. I mean, that's a really bad example and I don't like it. I probably never use it now that I've actually said it, but it's just one of those things where if, if you really need to have that role in there, don't go all the way into failure mode unless it's like a one. And even then I would have it work, but have there be some sort of negative impact to it or something like let's go back to the door. There's some sort of arcane alarm, like a magic mouth on the door so that if it opens up an alarm will go off so that they've got their opening, they can, can kind of continue on going and doing what they're, they're there to do. But now there's a consequence to doing it. But even then I still don't like that. I just would have not had the role in the first place. Yeah. If you, if you want to kind of, 
mechanicalize what Ben is describing. Use scaling DCs. Yeah. Where I say, okay, I have a difficulty check, difficulty class in my mind of 15, right? That gets the person through the door. No noise, nothing. It's just clean lockpick. Step down to a DC of 12 or a DC of 10. That gets the person through the door, but the door creaks really badly. Makes some noise. Uh, even scale it down to seven or nine, right? That gets you through the door, but it trips something on the other side of the door that you didn't notice, which alarms and uh, causes bad guys to come. So there's there's it's it's something that you it's a little more work on the the DM to do stuff like that or figure those types of things out on the fly. But having a system of scaling difficulty classes and this is you could even make a chart like I'm just I'm just kind of thinking about this right now. You could easily make a, a difficulty class scaling chart with uh, generic succeed, uh, but uh succeed but and this mm-hmm. or if you wanted to go above and beyond you could do succeed and gain or you know stuff like that so like i beat the difficulty class that i that it was set by 10 well in this specific situation that gets you in the door and other cool stuff happens. Maybe there was something cool behind the door, right? Uh, so this is all stuff you can do on the fly. This is, again, more work from a DM perspective, but scaling difficulties can really help with that protection or really help players with that that are like trying to get stuff done or have good ideas but are just having a bad role play. Yeah. Remember, you're not playing against your players. Everybody's working together. It's collaborative. So you know what? Failures happen. You try to make the most of them, try to have fun, but successes are way more fun usually. So just kind of keep that in mind and try to keep a balance going as best you can. Yep. (laughs) And speaking of balance, our last question (laughs) uh, is, do you all like the idea of rolling with emphasis on important roles that you would want to be swingy? And if so, how would you go about establishing this home rule and what kinds of roles would you consider using it for? So rolling with emphasis is something, this is from a uh, Brendan Mulligan thing. Yeah. One uh, of the dimension rule that, that he, he does. Uh, and when he calls for a role with emphasis, I believe, what is it? Is it rolling two D20s? Yep. And then uh, you take... It's the the furthest from 10. Furthest from 10, yeah. And so it's it's a way to introduce an incredibly swingy roll where you're either do really well or fail or potentially fail very miserably. Or magnificently, depending on how you look at it. Or magnificently, depending on how you look at it. So uh, I've had kind of heard of this before. I never, never used it. What do you what do you think of this, Ben? And is there any situations that you can think of where you would or you would use something like this? You know, the only thing that I can think of that I would ever really use this for is when it's like things aren't going right for the party or, you know, some sort of conclusion is about to happen. Like to me, this is the um, full court three pointer shot at the buzzer kind of thing. So if it's like, this is our last ditch effort to get one thing going swing with emphasis that way, you know, if, if that basketball sink, it gets sunk into the baskets. It's amazing. Everybody loves it. It's you know, ah, we win. I forgot to mention the teams were tied, of course. Anyways, ah, we win. But if you miss it, it's you know, you had that big swing, you had that chance. Um in this instance, if you don't make the basket, then you're fed to sharks. And it's it's a bad thing that happens. <laughs> So, you know, you really want to make sure you tried your, your, your last effort to do this. This is the only time I'd probably really do this. I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of 
really doing this sort of thing constantly. I, I just, I don't know. I, I like having my DCs there. I like having them be hit kind of telling a story that way, as opposed to, you know, just wildly one way or the other the whole time. But as far as I know of, uh, I, I now I haven't watched the specific dimension 20 that this was used in, but I doubt that this was used constantly for like everything. So like, like I said, I, I really think in the most desperate of situations, I can see this happen. Yeah, no, this is, this is certainly something uh, while interesting that I can't really think of a ton of scenarios that it would be really appropriate for, at least in the, the way I play in my, my play style of games. Mm -hmm. Like I don't think that I would really be incented to use something like this unless I prepared a scenario specifically to do it. Yeah. Right. Um, like big, big D a D 20 is already fairly swingy. Mm -hmm. Like that's a, it's a big dice, right? Um, and we're going to talk about it here in a few minutes, but I like Daggerheart uses D 12s, which the lower, the lower down dice you go, the less swinging you get. Yes. Right. So having, having something that is already very swingy become even more swingy. Uh, I don't know. It's just, it's like I said, if it, if it was a specific scenario or something I developed specifically for it, then I might consider doing something like that. But just in general, probably not for, for my specific play style or games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is also one of those things that you don't want to just randomly throw at your players either. This would be a session zero of what do you guys think of this? Would you want to use it in, in a desperate situation or, or, or not? Because otherwise you're turning a, you know, just a normal, Hey, Here's your DC. You, it might be a high DC, but you have a good chance of it winning too. Hey, this is going to swing wildly one way or the other. Which way do you want it to go? So, yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. I think it's, it's very much like a desperate situation type mm -hmm. mechanic. Like that. I could totally, that's, that's where I would foreseeably see it being used the most. Yeah. And, and even then too, I mean, like furthest away from 10 makes sense, but if you've got like a 12 and a nine, it, that's not the big swing that you're kind of looking for either. Like yeah, it might not always work out like yeah. that. Like yeah. I'd really want it to be like, it has to be at least a five or a 15 for something to happen. But even then it's, yeah, I don't know. I, I'd really have to kind of integrate it in to see how it would work out well, but it, to me, <laughs> It doesn't or really feel... go or really go in and watch what uh, where it's it's being used in an actual game. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it was the, in the context uh, around it, whichever the, the fairy dimension 21 was uh, um, quarter fay and flowers. Yeah, there you go. I think that's what the video said it was from. We will we'll have which a, is on, a which is on my list, but hasn't. Yeah, I haven't I haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah, it will have a link on the show notes of uh, this exact rule. And like I said, I think the, the person who created it said that's the one that it was uh, used in. So, yeah, it's 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 I might have. Concept. Yeah, who knows? I might have more thoughts after after I actually end up watching it. But <laughs> you come back, just... Ben, every single role was the swinging with emphasis and it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I might my my mind might get changed like massively, but just just on a surface level, that feels like something I would use uh, very very sparingly, if at all. Yeah, it's like making one of your your player characters main the main character of the entire story. It's like eh, it's not as much fun for everybody else. Why would you do something like that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, we really appreciate. Uh, all the people who are pinging us on discord, sending us emails so that we can do these mailbag segments every once in a while. So really appreciate everybody who sent stuff in. And uh, if you want to send your own thing in, uh, definitely join our discord, send an email to dndiscussions at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Definitely. Okay. 
Let's uh, talk just a little bit about Daggerheart. Ryan, that's not a D&D thing. Yes, because we actually do talk about other tabletop RPG things in this podcast. Uh, not necessarily exclusively, but this is a fairly big one. Obviously, this is from Darrington Press, uh, Critical Role, um, uh, Critical Role's game arm. Uh, Matt Mercer has uh, contributed game design to this. Spencer mm-hmm. Stark, I believe, is the main game designer of this. But there are many, 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 many people who have contributed to this new RPG. So this is a heroic fantasy uh, tabletop RPG uh levels one to ten so it keeps a, you know the fairly uh familiar leveling system you have your ancestries uh to pick from you have classes that uh you can choose you have subclasses in those classes um so on the surface there's just going through and we haven't dug super deep like we've been looking uh we've created characters on Demiplane, uh, who is going to be their official uh, digital experience for their character creator and their rules compendium and such. And we'll have links to all this, of course, in the show notes on indiscussions.com. But we've we've tried creating characters. We've been watching and reading uh, some of the stuff about it. Uh, so we're just going to this is this is just very initial thoughts. We have not gotten to play this yet. That is mm-hmm. the big disclaimer. Uh, I would love to do a one shot at some point of this, Uh, but as of right now, we have not actually played. We are just looking, consuming, building, right? Uh, This system uses a 2D12 system, which is rather unique. And uh, honestly, big ups for using D12s. Yeah, exactly. This is one of the most forgotten dice. Yeah, unfortunately, most of your BG sets only come with one, but that's okay because it, here it is. You, you really want to have two D12s that do not look the same because you're going to be rolling them at the same exact time. And one die needs to be um, specifically identified as a hope die, and the other one needs to be identified as a fear die. And this, from what we've we've been able to kind of glean and from seeing like the how tos and everything, this is going to be a lot of the main rolling that you're going to be doing throughout the you know your gameplay. So a character will roll their hope and fear die and based on whichever one is the higher number is going to be the outcome that happens, you know, as opposed to any sort of like, like uh, DC or difficulty check that you're used to with like Dungeons and Dragons and other 20 based systems. This is just hope and fear. Whichever one comes up is what's going to happen. And it, it's an interesting way to kind of do this because not only are hope and fear, the dice that you roll, but they're also a currency that you're going to be using to, um, you know, uh, like hope you use for, for, you know, doing different actions or, or, uh, activating abilities and stuff as a, as a player. Whereas if fear wins out, then the DM gets like a fear token that they're able to use, you know, against you. And that's how their actions and abilities and everything are kind of feel, you know, some of them are and everything. And the whole way or the whole way that the game is played is you're going to be constantly like refilling your hope and, um, you know, using it for different actions and abilities. So it's kind of like, um, if you're looking at it in like video game terms, like this is your, 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 your energy or something. When you're out of that, you need to do things that'll kind of help you gain it back. Whereas anytime you get the fear, that's when say your enemy gets more energy and they're able to do things and stuff. And it's, it's a really interesting balance that they've kind of presented here. Uh, yeah, it's 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 really it's really kind of interesting. It's obviously and we were just talking about this. This system is going to be less swingy than mm-hmm. a D20 based system. In fact, it sounds like the uh, the game master actually uses a D20 for the NPCs while the players use the D12 system. So from a GM perspective, you're going to have probably swing your roles than your players. This is a uh, more heroic fantasy. And it sounds like just from reading the interviews, they wanted less chance of thing of you not having something that happens mm-hmm. when you take a turn or when you roll a dice, like there's, there's some automatic damage stuff um, that you can do uh, or there's some automatic hits that can be made. 
or certain things. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I, I totally get, um, wanting to try and cut down on the, I rolled a hit. I miss that's my turn. Like, I totally get that because that is certainly a frustrating aspect of RPGs. Um, and it's also it's also interesting too because even if your fear die is higher, because the GM uh, will have a a difficulty for a check in mind, right? So let's mm-hmm. say it's it's thirteen. So you roll your hope and fear die, you add them together, and then you add any extra modifiers you have to that total. And if that total meets or beats, then that's the the success. But if the fear die was higher. It's a, it's one of those success, but something may happen things. Mm-hmm. And if the hope die was higher, it's more the cleanest, you know, success. And, you know, it's, it went well or, or something like that. So that's, that's kind of, uh, it, it's, if you ever played the star Wars RPG, <clears throat> um, it's very much like that where you can succeed, but, or, you know, fail and mm-hmm. or succeed and type thing. Uh, it's it's a like partially that right uh, kind of built into the, the dice rolling system. So that's uh, that's kind of their baseline. You have six stats, uh, the character creation, honestly. For any D&D player specifically would be very uh, familiar in a lot of ways. Just uh, you have stats, you have <clears throat> you have six stats, you have equipment, you'll have a class, you'll have a subclass, that sort of thing. Yeah, and it's it's kind of neat in in um, the the different ways that they've done this is that the different classes have like kind of two aspects to them that you're able to pull abilities from. So, uh, for instance, um, like I chose a bard just to kind of play with. Um, then from there you have two different subclasses you can choose from, whether it's a a troubadour or like a a spoken word, uh, wordsmith. Um, and then as you choose that, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of like, you know, okay, well this does this sort of thing. This just does that sort of thing. Just like a normal subclass would in, um, dungeons and dragons, but you know, you have your emphasis, but the cool thing about it is, is that later on based on your domain, which is an, another kind of part of this. Um, each class has a domain name that it, it pulls from, whether, it, uh, well, for a bard, it's codex or grace. And based on that, there's different abilities that you can choose from and you can pull from either domain. Just however, again, you see your characters kind of fit. Um, each of the classes has um, two domains to pull from. I forget. Um, let's see. And, and they do share across certain ones. Like, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, there, I believe there's nine classes now and there's a potential like 36 different combinations of domains. Yeah. So uh, they're... if they end up going, going that route, obviously this is beta. There will probably be more classes and or subclasses added before the game comes out. I believe they've just said 2025. So sometime in 2025. Yeah. So currently there's uh, Arcana, Blade, Bone, Codex, Grace, Midnight, Sage, Splendor, and Valor. And they all mean their own kind of different things. But they they match up with, um, you know, kind of the... the the base class that you're, you're going from, which is really interesting. And I'm going to not do it any sort of justice. And I know in this description, I'm not doing too great on it as well, but uh, for something along the lines of like a a wizard or something, they might have like arcana or like say sage as their thing. I I could be wrong. I don't know what goes with what right now, Um, but it's, you know, it's an idea of like, you use these to flavor what your subclass and your class is, and you're able to pull abilities from there. And as you level up, you have access to more and you can change them out and have up to five domain abilities at a time, but you can swap them out in a short rest. And there's, there's a lot of just like extra little things that they think of, of putting stuff into these characters while still keeping it kind of simple at the same time by limiting you on what you have essentially loaded into your character for the, you know, for the time being. Yeah, and from a from a stats standpoint, the stats definitely seem uh, somewhat simplified. You've got your agility, strength, finesse, instinct, presence, and knowledge. So you don't have they don't go up to 
massive numbers. Like I'm looking at my level one. I have like a plus one agility, plus two strength, negative one finesse, you know, plus one presence, no knowledge or instinct bonuses. But mm-hmm. there's not like a you're, you're not adding ability points. It's not like a 10 translates to a zero, 12 translates to a plus one, 14 translates to a plus two or whatever. It's it's just very baseline, mm-hmm. which is kind of nice in some ways, honestly. Um, but one of the things I do like about the D&D ones, even though like a an odd stat doesn't really do anything for you just from a, I guess, fantasy standpoint, I can look at it and immediately go someone with a 14 strength is going to be that much stronger than the baseline of 10 Mm -hmm. or whatever. And I mean, you could, I guess you could kind of, uh, suppose the same things like a plus like how much better is plus one than a, like the normal person of zero i don't i'm not sure exactly but it certainly simplifies the math yes. a lot because it is a little weird even even today i still look at that sometimes and i go what's the use of having these odd <laughs> odd stat <laughs> numbers um but but regardless, so you've got your your six stats, you've got armor points uh, and armor slots. You've got HP, stress, uh, you have experience, which this was kind of an interesting piece of the character creation. Yeah, um, the- you're you basically have <clears throat> it's it's very free for. And I think and as we talk, you'll find that I think that's true about the whole system in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. Um, but you have these experiences where basically they give you guidelines, but you can just say like guardian or cook for the king or something like that. And then in a situation where you're asked to roll, if you can relate one of those experiences to that role, then you get to add those extra bonuses. And then I believe you get more experiences as you level up. So it's kind of an interesting thing, uh, but it's also something that's very nebulous as well. Mm -hmm. So you would have to be very careful because who knows that experience may never come up or you may have something that just may never be able to relate. So it's, it's something that you'll have to, to watch and kind of work with your game master for. And I feel like, uh, as I'm just slowly reading out the rules, the, that's kind of a theme throughout Daggerheart is that it definitely seems that more of the weight, if you looked at it like a pair of scales, the GM definitely has the heavier load Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways uh, in this game, as far as either explaining how things are done or um, making rulings uh, or in the way combat runs, which is interesting. And uh, it's because Daggerheart uses a non-initiative based system, which to be fair, it's not new, right? There are yeah. plenty of other systems that don't use initiative coming from D and D though, as, and that's kind of the perspective we're looking at this because that's one of the main games we play. Not that we, uh, haven't played other i like i love vampire i love cthulhu like i love i love all these uh different rpgs there's so many i want to play i want to play i want to play pirate borg like i (laughs) want i want to play kids on brooms like there's there's a lot of different stuff that i still want to try out but specifically coming from DD, going from uh taking a group from initiative to no initiative is a pretty pretty big jump because as is described, um, combat in Daggerheart has no initiatives, no rounds, no distinct number of actions you can take on your turn. Instead, any fights that happen play out narratively moment to moment, just like any other action characters might take. This provides the players opportunities to team up together in their tactics, respond appropriately to the narrative changes in the scene, and not be locked into only doing violence once the first strike happens. Similarly, enemies don't have a set order in which they act. Instead, the GM will make moves in accordance with the fiction. Oftentimes, these moves will happen when a player rolls with fear 
or fails the action they are attempting, but a GM can make a move anytime the narrative demands it. And um, the GM also, as players are rolling with fear, the GM acquires this fear currency up to 10, I believe. And I think players could hold five hopes. So this is this is currency that they are expecting you to just spend and gain mm-hmm. throughout throughout your session, throughout the campaign. Um, and use it to have enemies do extra things or use a list of uh, options you can spend fear on to do extra things. Uh, this, to me, seems like a system that would fit pretty well with the critical role cast, which is unsurprising as yeah. the DM for that cast is a co-creator of this system. Uh, this seems like it would reward very improv heavy, very role play heavy groups who all get along well, who are all uh, very outspoken uh, and all uh, very willing to speak up this type of system. And again, this is just initial impressions. This is not the final end all be all of our opinions. Right. But this seems to me that this would be a lot more onus on the game master to make sure that everyone got a, a an equalized chance of playing that uh, it didn't skew too heavily one way to the players or to the the GM themselves. Um, and it certainly could weigh heavier on people who do not uh, are not as forceful, do not speak up as much, might be more shy or might be more timid. Uh, where as something like initiative, they uh, we know when they know when their turns, right? Mm-hmm. They have a turn. They're always going to get a turn. The enemies have a turn. They're always going to get a turn. So people can kind of know what to expect. I feel like this would be easier with less enemies and, you know, three to five players. But once you scale that out more, it would probably become a much harder lift from a bookkeeping aspect and keeping track of things aspect. Yeah. And I mean, I, I haven't watched their, uh, their like session zero play yet. Um, you know, I've watched the character creation and again, the overview and everything, and it, it does seem interesting. And I think, like you said, it's going to be a great system for the critical role cast. And I'm really looking forward to actually watching that, that first session that they have. Um, and, you know, potentially maybe more, you know, campaign four or whatever they're doing. I'm, I'm assuming they're probably going to be using dagger heart at that point, but you know, we'll see what happens. Um, but you know, overall it, it's a different type of system and I'm curious to see how it goes. And, I like some of the ideas like the, the hit, the way that they do hit points is really interesting to me. And you know, you, you get uh, like on this character that I made, which is a, a little ribbit bard, you know, frog person. Woohoo. Um, you know, like if the, I, the, one of the coolest, they, they, uh, they, the current system as is definitely uh, plays more to the animal folk, mm-hmm. which is funny with Humblewood just coming out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. On D and D Beyond recently, introducing a lot more people to that campaign setting. That is very much like animal folk things. So everybody seems to really be loving the frog people. Well, they're cool. What can I say? I mean, frog people. I mean, his name's not Kermit. I mean, I just threw a name in there. So his name's Joey. You know, Joey the Frog. Anyways, but like you know, hit points are handled in an entirely different way, where the damage you take actually falls within a certain threshold, which tells you how many hit points you lose. And this isn't like a, hey, you know, I've got my barbarian; he's level ten. I've got 107 hit points. This is uh, I have six hit points, and uh, depending on you know again where that damage threshold kind of falls, that determines on you know how many hit points you can lose, which is one, two, or three, like. It's pretty yeah. great. Different knowing. classes have different damage thresholds, yeah. which is super cool. But it's also great knowing that, hey, I've got six hit points. There's no way I'm going to die on this turn if I get attacked, which is wonderful. Um, but again, that that falls more into a, a role playing kind of feature than just pure straight up, you know, 
roll some dice, do some damage combat and stuff that we're used to with, with the D20 system like Dungeons and Dragons. So it's definitely very different. It's focus seems to be different, but at the same time, overall, I think it's going to be kind of interesting. And uh, like I said, those experiences that you just kind of make up and hope that they get used. I think that's a really cool idea because it's similar to the, uh, Hey, I know a person rule, you know, in D and D where it's like, you know, you, you yeah. get that one or two, like, Oh, Hey, I know a person. Then they, they just kind of make someone up on the spot and everything. Uh, but this is something that's kind of cool. Like uh, on, on my, my Joey, the frog here, um, as a bard, I have, um, uh, played the last song as like an experience, you know, I'm thinking, um, you know, I'm, I'm playing in the string quartet on the Titanic as it goes down, you know, I'll always be there till the end of the fight or something. So maybe because of that, you know, if like, say the, I don't know, characters are, are, are really hitting hard and things are looking really bad and set the bleakest, I might get a bonus because I've been in the situation before or something, you know, it's just things like that. It, it, it seems cool. And I love the development of the character that you get to do. But again, I need to see how it works in an actual game because. Yeah, I'm excited to watch it. Yeah, like because what? I think it's like it's it's a few hours long. Yeah, so like three or four or something like that. Yeah, I haven't I haven't had the chance to do it yet. But yeah, I, I'm really excited to see how it plays out as an actual thing. And I just reading just initial impressions reading through this. There are it feels like there are certain tables who will probably gobble this up. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Who are just very like. Yeah, we're just super RP uh, improv heavy. I think this type of game will fit those tables like a glove. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. And, you know, the best part of Dungeons & Dragons, other than playing it, is making characters. So having a big emphasis on the character you make is kind of cool. So we'll Yeah, uh, and we'll making characters happens. wasn't super hard either. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, I think they did a pretty good job with character creation and it made it uh, mm-hmm. very easy and understandable. Oh, very uh, so. Especially because they launched with Demiplane, which was a super great move on their part. The mm-hmm. The Demiplane character sheet is phenomenal. Like they did, a, they did an awesome job with that. But even paper sheets, they have a really cool thing called a sidecar. Yeah. Uh, so it, you have your character sheet and then you have a sheet that you print out behind it. And if you slide the sheet out that's behind it halfway to either side of your character sheet, it has explanations on the stats and abilities on that side of the character sheet. So if you're like, crap, what did does stress do again? You just pull out your little sidecar on the left and it has a little arrow pointing to stress and it just says a full on description of what it is. It It's it's. It's so simple, but it's genius. Like mm-hmm. it's a, it was just a, a great move to have something like that, that you'd be able to easily move over to help remind you and would be amazing for new players. Uh, what stuff does. Yeah. It makes me want to do something like that for new players for D and D, which uh, that character sheet has a lot of information on it and finding out where everything is would be very nice and very easy and helpful right away. Yeah, I hope to see that kind of thing for for all these systems, Mm -hmm. character sheets like that's just I think that could be especially if you're playing again physically versus having your iPad with something like Demiplane or D&D Beyond or Roll20 or Foundry or something like that. Having something, especially maybe at a convention when you're handing out Mm pre-mades, having a little sidecar type thing to go along with it for any system. Sounds like a, a wonderful idea. So big kudos to them for doing something like that, because that certainly will help out newer players. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one other thing that I really, uh, it kind of caught my eye and I liked was their uh, death, death rules. Mm-hmm. Um, death in Dagger Heart uh, seems to be a little bit more permanent than something like D&D. Uh, there does not seem to be a lot of ways to actually resurrect a character where versus D and D you have several classes that have some sort of resurrection spells on them. Right. Uh, but in Daggerheart, they actually even say in the death rules, it's possible to resurrect a dead character, though it likely will be a long, difficult and costly process. And they likely won't return the same as they died. 
Uh, if the party decides to take up on this path, the GM will let players know how to make it happen. But there's also a one-time resurrection spell available at level 10, which is the highest level of Daggerheart uh, for any class that includes the Splendor Domain. But once the spell is used, it will go into your vault permanently. So it's they they very much seem... Again, this this is a story thing, right? This is an RP thing. Uh, it seems like they very, very much want death to be the ultimate consequence. Um, but when yeah, when you mark your last hit point, you get to make a death move in Daggerheart, uh, which you get to choose one of three options. You get to embrace death and go out in a blaze of glory. You get basically you get to take an action, uh, which becomes an automatic critical success. And then cross into death. So kind of cool. Go out in a blaze of glory. Uh, you get to avoid death and face consequences. You drop unconscious. Uh, you roll your fear die. And if the value is equal to or under your level, you take a scar. Um, you can't do anything while you're unconscious. Uh, and when you have any number of your marked hit points cleared by an ally or on your party's next long rest, you return to consciousness. Uh, and scars are basically things that uh, permanently cross out one of your five hope slots. So you can't then gain hope up to that five mark anymore, which is kind of interesting. And then you can describe it as a physical thing or a mental thing or an emotional thing. Um, and then you have the risk it all, which you get to roll your your hope and fear dice. And if your hopes higher, you stay on your feet. You clear an amount of hit points and or stress equal to the value of the hope die. You divide between those two. Uh, but if your fear dies higher, you die. And that's just how it is. And if you uh, tie, which tied dice are basically their crit, uh, you stand your feet and you clear all hit points and stress. So it's like the ultimate gamble, essentially. Uh so I, I like that. I think there's some really cool stuff in those death mechanics. And mm -hmm. I have done the honestly done the blaze of glory thing in D&D. &D. This was this would actually be a super easy system to port over to D&D. &D. But I've done that blaze of glory type thing in D&D &D before where if someone's about to die. I'll be like they, they'll be like, can I do one more thing? And it's like, yeah, sure. Do one more cool thing. Do one more action. Cast one more spell you know, type thing. So, but it's a, it's a cool system, uh, but it's a very different mindset from the D and D type system where certain parties death is not as big of a deal. Yeah. And I'm really interested to see, you know, how it actually plays out in the game as well. Like is death a, a more likely thing at certain levels, kind of like how in D and D level one, extremely deadly, but, you know, how is it with uh, with Daggerheart? Who knows? Um, and on top of that, too, you know, depending on how combats go and stuff like that, um, it, it, again, is it something that's as kind of what seems like a more RP heavy game? Is death going to be one of those things that happens a ton? Like if you're playing the Tomb of Annihilation or, you know, maybe even Curse of Strahd or something like that, where you come across some pretty gnarly things and, you know, in D&D, death happens and it's not exactly it should be expected but you can't count it out you know are they keeping those resurrections away so that these characters are are you know special to you and they stay that way so that they have like these dramatic endings or is it more of a okay well the chance of a full death is going to be kind of rare but if it does happen we're making sure they go out with a bang in some sort of way you know it 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 really Again, this is, this is going to play in a lot more when a lot more play testing is done and we're able to see kind of how things work out in, in combat and stuff. But like overall, it, it's interesting. And yeah, as a final thing, I totally think that especially those blaze of glory things or the risk at all and stuff is something that you can easily bring into D&D. &D. Oh, for sure. And I and, you know, obviously. uh We'll probably have another segment where we deep dive a little bit more because there's not brand new big tabletop RPG systems, systems every day. And it's yeah. it's something uh, that's from people that we have lot watched for a long time. Um, 
and have been around in the space for a long time. So it's certainly something interesting uh, to, to cover for sure. One other thing I really like about it, uh, they have amazing art. Yes. Uh, incredibly diverse art, which is wonderful to see um, coming just from a, a new tabletop RPG. And there, the rule system is very, uh, very good about handling a lot of the session zero stuff, talking about lines and veils uh, right in the core rule book. I hope we see more of that session zero and consent type stuff in the new player's handbook slash dungeon master's guide as well uh, as we see the 2024 D and D revisions come around because that is incredibly handy stuff, especially for new players and new DMS to have or be intro to as they are starting up their games. Mm -hmm. Yep. Totally agree. So as this uh, develops, we'll kind of keep following it. Yep. And if you want to try it out yourself, daggerheart.com, or uh, www.demiplane.com. And there is a dagger heart nexus as well that is currently free to use. You can create your own characters uh, using all the beta playtest stuff. Next, uh, before we uh, wrap things up, we wanted to give a few shout outs. The first is, and this is super funny because I <laughs> I saw this just randomly scrolling and I, I think we had one or two people link it in the Discord as well. Uh, NASA, NASA of all people, put out a tabletop RPG like D&D &D module. <laughs> it's so great <laughs> just so random so it, it, it's it's called the lost universe uh it's time to gather your party and your favorite tabletop role-playing game system so it's it's kind of system agnostic uh a little bit or you could easily easily adapt it um from what i looked at it doesn't look like it's super combat heavy right um yeah. but a dark mystery is settled over the city of Aladis Strawn on the rogue planet of, of Alexars, Alex, Exlaris. Ex, <laughs> I don't even know. But researchers dedicated to studying the cosmos have disappeared. And the Hubble Space Telescope, because this is the big you know, mm -hmm. thing around this, has vanished from the Earth's timeline. Only an ambitious crew of adventurers can uncover what was lost. Are you up to the challenge? Uh, the adventure is designed for a party of four to seven. Uh, level seven to ten characters is easily adaptable for your preferred tabletop role playing game system. Uh, so it is totally free to download. They've got a little video, uh, super random but super fun, like a little exploration puzzle base type uh, type thing. Might be fun if you're looking for a one shot for your your favorite game system one night. Run it in Daggerheart. I don't know. Maybe yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, we will have the link to that in the show notes as well. If you want to check that out. Also, a uh, brand new book uh, chronicling the history of D&D &D called Of Dice and Men uh, was just published uh, for the 50th anniversary of D&D. &D, and it's uh, came out about 10 years ago. It's getting a re-release on the 10th uh, anniversary of its publication to kind of coincide with the big, you know, anniversary of D&D this year. It is by David Ewalt, um, and it kind of covers part memoir, part history of Dungeons and Dragons, um, and written as a layman's guide to role-playing games. So it originally came out in 2013. It just uh, had its re-release. There's some content in it as well, uh, as well as a forward by uh, Joe Manganiello and some new content. So uh, it sounds super interesting. Uh, we were actually sent copies of it that we are going to be checking out. Um, but Lynn Codega has on uh, rascal.news has an interview with David uh, that you can go check out and see if it sounds interesting and if it's something you would like to read. But there's a, a lot of history to this game and a lot of things around it. So if that's kind of up your alley in, you know, reading material, definitely check that book out. We will have a link to those things in the show notes as well. 
Yep, I'm really looking forward to digging in and getting in there because it, it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. And with that, uh, I think that pretty much brings us to the end of our episode for tonight. Uh, so thanks, Ben, so much for talking to me. Of course, before uh, we go, we usually like to talk a little bit about what's going on in our home games. Ben, have you gotten to play D&D yet? No, but there's a development. Oh, is there a date? We have a date for the next we session. We have a date. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Uh, it will not be until after we record our next episode, but uh, we've got a date set up and everything. March has been insanely busy every weekend, so getting some time in has been really rough, which is why I had to push it to uh, actually uh, the 6th of April. We're going to be getting together and playing, and I could not be more excited for this. We, we, we're going to have to go over like the how do you get get back in the mindset and get back in after a break that oh, yeah. long. I'll have a full talk about it afterwards to kind of see how everybody's feeling. I, I know that uh, again, it's going to be like how we talked about with that, that, that very first session with combat combat's going to take forever. I just know it because, you know, it's been forever since we've done anything like that. And people need to, you know, take the time to kind of reacquaint themselves with their characters, figure out what they can do, how they can work together again and stuff. Cause it, it has been quite a while. So in fact, that might even be a good call to action to put out to your players before it even happens. Hey guys, make sure you review your character sheets because it's been a while. Oh yeah. Spoilers for my, my, my uh, players. Um, I'm going to start uh, soon here. You know, probably the week or two lead up to this about every other day or so, probably put a character prompt to get back in the mindset of your character and think about it and stuff. And uh, so I'm, I'm actually looking forward to kind of coming up with a bunch of fun little things like that for them to uh, kind of do as a small, tiny RP exercises. Yeah, that sounds like a really good way to kind of get back into the swing of things after an extended break. Yeah. Plus, I think if I litter it with questions about how did your character feel about when this happened, it'll help kind of bring them back into what's been going on before the recap for our, our next session, too. Which is probably very long. Yeah, I'm I'm actually going to <laughs> I'm going to basically summarize the campaign up to this point because stuff that happens matters throughout the whole thing. So this is what we're going to be doing. It's going to be like a 10, 10 page half hour uh, monologue by me about everything that happened. And then uh, <laughs> we'll take a half hour break because I won't be able to talk. And then we'll get back in there and start rolling some dice. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, how about you though? Did you get a chance to play since uh, last uh, episode? Uh, I did actually, because we're recording this episode a little later than usual. Uh, I played last night, um, and the party dealt with the consequences of their little sewer sewer encounter, um, and rescuing uh, a bunch of refugees. It's, it's been really fun because at least and this is, I don't know if this is true for everybody or not, but in a lot of the campaigns I run a lot of them have been very adventure travel go to different towns and villages and you know do different things this whole campaign is taking place in a massive city there are laws there are rules there are regulations uh things the characters do can have direct consequences that they might just not have to deal with while they're out in the wilderness or while they're in a small town and they are th by far the most powerful, you know, beings there uh, in the city, especially this city, they are not, not in any way. So uh, getting them into that mindset of action reaction type thing has been has been really interesting because now they're starting to think about that a little more. Oh, can we go get the guards like do we need to team up with X, Y, or Z people like who runs this place, right? Who has the power here? Uh, and, oh, did we just disrupt something? There might be bad consequences that happen because we didn't 
disguise ourselves. We didn't do anything like that. Uh, we have homes. We have jobs. We have connections and roots into the city. And so there's so much of that type of stuff that a lot of campaigns, at least that I've ran, like it may just be true in general, don't have to worry about mm-hmm. that aren't city, like this big city established characters uh, based that they don't have to worry about those things. But these people have families here. Potentially they have roots here. They have homes and businesses and such. And so it's, it's a very big thing when they meddle with things, there might be things that react to that. And it's one of those, and they know where you live type things. Um, so it's it's very it's it was a very very great fun role play session uh, as they kind of talked through those things and figured them out. This is a very political intrigue campaign, so they're starting to get bits and pieces of several things. They're trying to connect the dots uh, of what is happening. One of the players' uh, sisters was kidnapped and is missing, and they are trying to. That is kind of the catalyst that started this whole thing. Uh, and they're slowly uncovering that this is might be a little bigger than they initially thought of someone just getting kidnapped. Right. So I'm, I'm very excited to see where things go as the, the puzzle unfolds and the pieces like, you know, fall into place. Definitely. It, so it's basically, uh, oh, what if uh, after Ash got Pikachu, he stuck around Palatown and started zapping everybody? It's like, oh, there's consequences when you're not out yeah. adventuring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just like the anything goes in the wilderness or these little farming towns or villages or whatever, you know, right? <laughs> uh, or or just like it's a big city or whatever, but I'm just stopping by. I don't have anything. Mm-hmm that's keeping me here or I don't have anything that can be used against me or whatever in this, this place. Like, so it's, it's thinking about stuff like that, that makes this very interesting. Yeah. That's cool. And very different. That's very cool. I'm, I'm excited to hear more about it and especially consequences for shenanigans are always fun to kind of explore and play around with. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Uh, but I'm I'm very much looking forward to our next session, but I'm also looking forward to uh, your next yeah. session and then getting to, to hear the continuation of that large epic campaign that you have have going. Well, yeah, I've got a what I think is a fun thing to come back to as well as some serious stuff on the horizon. So it's, it's going to be hopefully a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it. As am I, but until that point we have reached the end of our episode. So Ben, before we get out of here, why don't you tell everybody where they can be read, where you can be reached and where they can find the notes for all the things we've talked about. Of course. Um, well, if you're looking to just kind of reach out and want to send an email to us, uh, telling us about some of your stories or your thoughts on Dagger Heart specifically, because, you know, they're looking for feedback and we kind of want to hear some of it too. Uh, you can always send those emails to dndiscussions at gmail.com. Um, on top of that too, if you're looking for something just, you know, kind of quick and, uh, you know, a way to message us, uh, we are on blue sky social media. So check that out. It's open to everybody. Now you don't need a special invite for it. Um, so check out DN discussion. We are at DN discussions. Uh, if you're looking for Ryan specifically, he is at TBK Zord. If you're looking for me, I am at Ben Bumhofer. You can find us there. Another way to contact us, like I said, is our Discord. Uh, we'll have a link to that in our show notes, which, hey, guess what? The show notes can be found on dndiscussions.com. It's kind of like a whole theme we have going here with our name. It's, it's the way to find us. So dndiscussions.com, you can find uh, our links to all of our different community community pages there per, that we shout out each episode, uh, a link to our Discord. You can find links to our socials on there as well. It's an overall good place to go. It's a one-stop shop. Uh, and then last but not least, I have to shout it out because I'm having a lot of fun with it, though. Um, if you want to hear me playing some Dungeons and Dragons, you can always check out Plus Five to Hit. It is an actual play that uh, we've been going through Rhyme of the Frostmaiden, and uh, we're kind of, you know, dealing with shenanigans there and and uh, well, trying to save Ten Towns or 
spoilers right now. It's five towns, but we're working on it. So uh, love to hear from everybody. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Ryan. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. Thank you, everybody, for writing in, asking questions. And uh, you know what? Thank you for da or, uh, Darrington Press to you know work on Daggerheart, because that's interesting. I'm looking forward to more of that. But anyways, in the meantime, and until next time, everybody, roll high and be good to each other. Take care, and we'll see you soon.